Thank you, Scott. It's a good song, isn't it? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I'm just thinking about something a little bit silly this a while ago. That's very unusual for me. But I was, I was doing that. I was thinking, just wondering, how many of you in this room ever took in your life um, a foreign language course? Some of you. All right. Number of you. So, if I were to say, good morning to you, it's kind of like, you know, actually that was the word translated all hail when Mary greeted the Lord on the first east of the resurrection morning. But I was wondering what that would sound like in French, for example. So what would it be? Good morning is what? What? All right. Sounds good to me. What about German? Anybody have German? Good morning. <laughs> what about Italian? <laughs> All right. Wow, we're doing pretty well. What about uh, Spanish? <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, listen. So we just been around the world, haven't we? <laughs> Well, in West Virginia, it was, huh. <laughs> so, I'm not sure what the difference is. Well, good morning to you. And when we think about that, we greet each other in the name of the Lord from all around the world. So, glad you're here. Glad you're here. Uh, some announcements this morning. Have you looked in the bulletin? Uh, some events for this week. A worship committee people, note the meeting on Tuesday evening at uh, 6 o'clock. The announcements on down the page and on the back, notice on the back, a week from Tuesday, the 26th. Craig, do you want to say anything about that? Well, uh, this has been a very uh, important outreach for us, the senior suffers, and so we've experienced some problems in terms of cooks servers and so on for us because they've been doing quite a bit of work and they would like to see other people come in. So we need to talk about what is realistic in terms of continuing these suppers, how many, who's going to be doing it, so on and so forth. So I'd like everybody that's had a part in it to please come and anybody here in the church is interested also to come because we have resources and we have other things that we can put to our advantage now, but we need to talk about what we're going to do and what's realistic. Please make every step to come. We try to do it during the week because we know summer weekends are kind of, you know, hard to get people together. So please come on a Tuesday evening and we'll say what we're going to do. I think there's an interest in that level, but whether we're going to continue in intensity weeks and we can suffer from that. So let's talk about what is really Okay? Okay. A week from Tuesday. And we got a few of these downstairs. It says something about Hogan Tire. Now, Bill Higgins left these, certainly no implication, but if there, there are some downstairs. So if you need a, if you need a, a, a yard, yeah, a yardstick. <laughs> and I told, I told him that I would take some, uh, some sandpaper, and I think I could scrub off the Hogan Tire name here, <laughs> probably. So it, it, it would be, be okay. Now, with regard to that, though, Bill and Steve brought back a whole bunch of food from yesterday's picnic. Wasn't that good for those of you there? It was good. Good stuff. So it's down in the refrigerator. So tie something around your finger. Go down there after church today and take some food home. All you have to do is put it in the microwave, warm it up a little bit, and you've got some chicken, some hot dogs, some hamburgers, and all kinds of stuff down there. So it's down in the refrigerator. And we, we don't want to throw it away. Um, and, and, we, and we can't sell it. So if you can use it. If any of you men are scheduled to fix lunch today, you know where you can get it, right downstairs. So after church, would you do that? Go down and help yourself. There'll be a couple of guys down there maybe to help you uh, get organized uh, for that. We're here today to worship the Lord. 
I heard a long time ago somebody saying something like this, Jesus, yes, the church, no. You ever heard anything like that in your life? Sure you have. Some of you have. It was a popular saying back when some of us were younger and we had good memories. And it was kind of a, a slap in the face of what some people felt was going on in the church. And in some sense, they, they were saying that they felt the church was moving away from its founder, moving away from the Lord. And we have echoed through many years, not so. We don't want that to be so. It shall not be so. The church is one foundation, one foundation. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ, her Lord. It was said of Billy Graham, and I think I quoted you, this to you before, that somebody said to him one time about his ministry, that, do you know, sir, that you're, you're setting the church back some 200 years with your style of ministry and preaching? And he said, I'm sorry. I am truly sorry. It was never my intent to set the church back 200 years. 2,000 years has been my choice. So in that spirit, let's sing hymn number 277. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's stand and sing together. to us, the gift of the church, the body of Christ expressed in this world through people just like us here in this place and other congregations around this town, around this state and throughout the world. Oh Lord, we thank you for the church of Jesus Christ, faithful to the day, faithful to the one who is not only in this day, but in all days the one by whom days are number, the one of whom it is said that we will seek 
and approach the day of the Lord. Thank you for being Lord to us and for being among us, within us, and working through us. We pray today in the blessed and holy name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Craig, do you have? Children, come on up front here. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning, Ben. I know what I'm going to ask first this morning. What kind of rainbows did you have this week? We went to Vermont. We went to Vermont for three days. Okay. Where about in Vermont? Northfield to my grandmother's apartment. Oh, yeah. Great. Vermont's a beautiful place. We used to live there, too. How about you? Did you have a rainbow this week? Mm. No. Not really? Did you play with your family, friends, your animals, your pets, and all that kind of stuff? We rode our horses. Horses? Oh, good. How about you? Did you have a blessing this morning or a rainbow? You went on a terror ride. Um, okay, that's good. How about if, it, did any of you do something where you were a rainbow to somebody else this week? Remember, Rose used to talk about seeing rainbows, and then we kind of switched after she left and started talking about where have you been able to be a rainbow to some other people? Yes, Ben. Um, I have one of my friends older, or over, and my brother was left out, so we invited him in. <laughs> yeah, we let him play with us, so he was happy. Okay, good. Well, this week, we're going to talk about your, your story this morning, is God tells us that our bodies are a temple. Now, what does that mean to you before I get into the story? What, what does it mean that your body is a temple? Any thoughts? It means that it's something that we should cherish, take care of, nurture. We need to do certain things, which I'm going to put, bring out of my bag here in a minute and tell you. But we are an extension of Jesus' life. We're supposed to be holy, and there are certain things we need to do in order to build ourselves up so that we can do this. And you are all at the age now where you can do certain things to, to begin to grow in a proper way. So let me pull some things out of my grab bag here. I want you to tell me which is... What are these? That's right, Tori. They're very dirty. <laughs> um, these are uh, actually these are $150 shoes that I wear because I run quite frequently and um, but why why are these important we for our body what do we need to do we need to yeah, exercise. exercise right very good and you should continue exercise they say sometimes four or five times a week at least a half an hour and as you're growing up, that's very important that you exercise because you're tempted now to be in your Kindles and to watch television things, to be couch potatoes. You don't want to do that. You want to be doing things that where you're exercising your body. Okay, good. Now, the next thing is we want to be able to eat properly, proper nourishment for our bodies. Which one of these is more better for us here's this is a can of soda this is a bottle of water which is better for us what's wrong with a soda bottle lots too much sugar yes and it can rot your teeth right 
That's right. Okay, now, which one of these would you prefer to, for your body to grow the way it should? There's a real potato, a Rustic County potato, and what's this? Potato chips. Now, what's the difference between the two of these? The, they both come from the potato. Makes it, um, the salt makes it less healthy. Unhealthy? And the fat. But the potato itself is okay, but they're, they're now getting smart. They're starting to design potato chips with good oil so that we probably are going to be able to enjoy them where we are. There's a lot of sugar and carbohydrates here, but this is good for us. In fact, we've a petition Senator Collins to allow this to be in the lunch programs, to have the, the potato, because it is very nourishing to the body. But you really, right now, until the potatoes are refined, you should use this potato here, okay? Baked potato, whatever it is you want to do. Okay, now, we know we need to have sweets. Which would be the preferable one? There's candy here, and there's an orange. Which is the best for you? Orange. Orange? Do you eat oranges often? Okay. Now, some of these candies, you can get them without the sugar in them, but still. And chocolate's good for you, too. Uh, so there's kind of a drawing line there. Okay, now, the other thing... So that's our body. Exercise, eat right. And then we got not only our body and our mind, when you're, when you're going to school, you're all learning things so that you can maximize your ability to do things in your own life and also to help others. And then you have a spirit, too, that needs to be nurtured. So we know what that's, what's required for that, right? The Bible. You should be reading your Bible every day so that you have it. When you get all done, you're going to be a very balanced individual, and God's going to please with you, and Jesus is going to be pleased with you if you follow those rules. But you have to discipline yourselves to do this and have your folks help you with this. Exercise, eat right, and study your school and study your Bible, and you will do great things in your lives, and God will be pleased with you. Let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. Lord, uh, strengthen them as they grow both in body and mind and spirit so that they can serve you and serve their neighbors, their families, and all those around them. We thank you for all blessings you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Craig. And I, I have to give Craig a compliment. You know, he lives by those standards, too. <laughs> He, he really does. He, uh, he bicycles all the way down to Grand Lake. But I have a question about those potatoes. I noticed the potato was whole, but the potato chips had been open. Uh, I actually brought them from the picnic yesterday because I didn't have a potato bag at home. I got you. Okay. All right. Okay. I, I'm, I'm so glad. And uh, I hope you're not lying, Craig. <laughs> We're going to talk about our prayers and uh, our blessings and concerns. Now, I have a question about a garage sale. How'd it go? Very well. Um, the weather was amazing. Um, lots of customers, and about 500 dollars between two days. And a typical yard sale for us in the past, without raising money for any of the problems, was maybe 100, 150 in two days. Uh, All right. <laughs> so for Samaritan's Purse. Yes. Very good, very good. And those two girls were big helpers, right? <laughs> right. Mostly during the week. Okay. They helped a lot with it. Okay, all right, good. Yeah, that is good news. Uh, not only a blessing, but a blessing to others. Samaritan, Samaritan's Purse be the recipient. Other blessings you'd like to share? Yeah. Yeah, despite what some people were thinking, we, we were uh, dry, and we were well fed, had a good time. Wayne. I want to thank everybody for your prayers, for uh, friends and family. Keep them in your mind. Keep Marilyn, or, uh, Marla in your mind, because she's never been a home now, but she's got her daughter right down the road from her and her daughter, her sister-in-law across the street. 
Keep her in prayer. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you all again for the prayers. It was a big wedding her, a big funeral. Yeah. And uh, a lot of kind words were said. Good. Good, yeah, do keep them in, in prayer, the, the whole family as they go through this process. Tori? We had 21 members of our family at the camp to celebrate Sam's life. Yeah, it's good, good. One other thing, I was on my mind the whole time this past year about Bruce stand with the Lord. Found out that he gave his life to the Lord. So that was a blessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> it, it, a, gra a great blessing. Concerns you'd like to share? I'd like to have prayers for my good friend and classmate, Mary Grant. She had a stroke on Wednesday, and uh, she's not doing too well. Mary Grant. All right. Remember Joanne. Yeah, persecuted Christians. Yeah. for Louise. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, again, we want to say thank you for not only the privilege of being together and the joy in fellowship, but also the joy in knowing that we are together and coming before you with the spirit of thanksgiving and petition. We do remember those with special needs here in our church, in our community, and around the world. Sometimes, Lord, we are just moved to tears because of the pain of others. We see it in our homes, we see it in families, and we see it on our TV screens. Oh, how much we see it there. And Lord, we know that tears have been shed through many, many generations. We image in our minds the Garden of Gethsemane and the prayer of pain of our Lord. And we know that we who bear his name also bear some of that pain in our lives. We know also that the pleasure of painlessness is sometimes very short-lived. But we know too, Lord, that sometimes a deeper understanding of the meaning and purpose of life comes through bearing pain, our own and others. So help us to be more adventurous in bearing each other's pain and understanding that our world is not pain-free and that destruction and death surround us. We wish it did not, but we we're called upon to see and understand that through our dependence on you, we can, as it were, bear up under these particular times. So Lord, teach us through pain to come to you more fervently, more readily, and deepen our joy in knowing you and in your presence. And Lord, when those wonderful times come, times of celebration and great joy, 
Help us to be even more joyful and to understand how blessed and how wonderful and wonder-filled those moments can be for us as you bring healing to our troubled souls and healing to our troubled land. We don't have clear understanding about all of it in terms of its meaning, but oh Lord, help us to be strong and help us to be victorious as we lean on you. As we pray for each other and pray for our world, we do recognize that you have called us to be the church, your church. And help us to become more and more like you and to allow ourselves to be molded and made into your image so that we can reflect who you are and even experience some of your smile because of what you see among your people around the world and particularly here. So guide us, make us to be blessing as you continually bless us all in Jesus' name. So as we pray, we believe. We have a sense of anticipation that th through all of this, through all of life, you will be continually our Lord, our Savior. So we pray with faith and with anticipation in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Our ushers have prepared themselves to receive your gifts. So as you have prepared to give, we make it an act of offering, an act of worship. The ushers will wait upon you now.
Lord, is it, it is an act of praise toward you that we bring to the, today these gifts, our offerings. We praise you as we thank you in Jesus' name. And we ask that you will bless these gifts to their intended purpose, that the good name, the great name, the wonderful name of Jesus be preached here and from here throughout the world. To that end, we offer our gifts and ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Greet each other as you're, before you sleep. Let me in. <laughs> Let me invite you to take a hymn book, turn to page 28 in your hymn book, and I'm going to invite you to stand in a moment, but wait just before you do. I want to let you know that we're going to be singing from 28 over through 31. And this little brief service and the instructions up at the top says to facilitate an uninterrupted flow from stanza to stanza. The suggested stanzas have been marked with an arrow. So we're going to sing the suggested stanzas uh, on uh, 29, on 30, and 31. And when we get over to 31, we're going to sing right down to the end. It looks a little bit con uh, disconcerting over at the end, but you just follow along. And after we sing through it once, we're going to go back to the part right smack in the middle of the first page, which says, Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. And then we're going to go over to that top of the next page and sing loudly, loudly, loudly. So let's stand, begin with 28, a little service and recognition of God's majesty and power. Will you stand? And let's read together this, uh, this passage right here. Reading together, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is manful that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air. And
Now that we've rehearsed that thing, we could do it again, couldn't we? <laughs> but we won't. We won't. Thank you and be seated. Thank you. Thank you. If you will look again in your hymn books over in the back to Responsive Reading, number 646. Go over to page 6, or number 646, and we're going to read this scripture again out of the back of the hymn book today. 646 on the church. Some familiar uh, scriptures from Matthew, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, and as we read it today, we want to do so very thoughtfully. By the way, if you want to, if you are moved at all to think about the church uh, after we finished uh, today in your home, you might want to look again and some more at the book of Ephesians, because it's difficult not to read the book of Ephesians and see what the church ought to be, what it was designed to be. Sometimes when we think about the church, we think about ourselves, who we are, and uh, what kind of a church are we. And we then think to ourselves sometimes, well, I think our church ought to do this. I think our church ought to do this. And I think our church ought to stop this and change that. And on and on and on it goes. We, we do that a lot. It's just human nature. We uh, spend a lot of time there. But you know, Paul had some very specific ideas about what the church is. By the way, he believed very strongly that the church is the body of Christ incarnate in the world. And he took that from teaching that he had received from the apostles and from God himself. The church, the body of Christ in the world, in this generation. And in the book of Ephesians, he talks about that. Remember that phrase, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all, in all, and through all. And the good old King James says, above all, like a good Southern Baptist, above all, in you all, uh, through you all. Powerful, powerful words. So we are the church. I remember a long time ago when I was working with young people. By the way, met a young man. He's downstairs now working with Sunday school kids who's down at Penny Memorial Church now um, as a layman, just like you folk, normal. You know, he really is normal. <laughs> and he's a young man down at Penny Memorial Church trying to... Uh, organized youth ministry all over again. Well, a long time when I was doing that kind of thing, the kids had a song. And the words went something like this, we are the world, and man, we got problems brought on by the sequence of events. Push comes to shove, and then there's more shoving brought on by the sequence of events. And the little chorus went, I'll tell you, there once lived a man with a plan that showed us how to live. Showed us how to live. And then it concludes with, He provides love. More than we got. And He only can provide love. Well, it caught some of the kids back there in the 70s, back there, a long time ago. And the church in the world is who we are. Somebody paraphrased that little song instead of saying the world, the, uh, 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 we are the world and man, we got problems. Somebody paraphrased it, we are the church and man, we got problems brought on by the sequence of events. And then, but I'll tell you, there once lived a man with a plan that showed us how to live together. It takes love, more than we got. And he only can provide love. Mm, it's kind of youthful in the way it says it, but I think we understand it. This scripture, 646, I'll read the light print, you read the dark print. He, Jesus, said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, son of John, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one Spirit. You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In whom the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, give us just a little insight into this great mystery that you call the church, the assembled ones, the congregation of God. And Lord, as you teach us, help us to be what you call us to be. In the name and the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. I remember a long time ago, I was listening to a man who was a psychologist. Henry Brandt was his name. Uh, some of you have read some of his books. He's um, a generation or so before the people that we know on the radio these days. But Henry Brandt influenced quite a few of us into ministry when we were um, in another generation a long time ago. But one, in one of his uh, talks, he gave to a group of committed Christians was this information. He said, when I was a young man, I committed my life to the church. Now, we fully expected him to say, I committed my life to Christ. But in that setting, he said, I committed my life to the church. I made a lifelong commitment to the church. And I've given my life to serve the Lord in and through the church. Now, as he further expressed what he was talking about, he mentioned things like the church is God's creation, is the creation through Jesus Christ of what God meant to be the last piece of the puzzle, the primary tool through which he would work to redeem the world. Now, it has less to do with how good we are and more to do with whose we are. Because I think we would all confess, oh Lord, we have not done as well as we wanted to do as a church. And the same spirit as most of you, when you bow your heads, you seldom say, oh God, I thank you that I have been perfect. We seldom say that. We're more often saying, Lord, I apologize. 
I'm sorry that I have not been all that I could have been in a certain circumstance or whatever it might have been. We're always confessing. Well, folks, that's the way it's supposed to be. If we confess our sins, the Bible says what? He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all that unrighteousness. Hmm. Well, the church needs to kind of recognize that too. We are not perfect, but we are perfectly His. We are completely His. So it is His body, the church. And in this conversation, I have another sermon on that subject, and you may even get it before I'm done here, who knows, about this conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Who do they say that I am, and who do you say that I am? You know, all that conversation. And then he looks right at Peter and says something interesting. Well, let's, how, how did he say it? Um, I also say to you, it's in this text, it, it's from Matthew, I also say to you that you are Petros, that's Peter, and on this Petra, I will build my church. What Petra? Well, Petra is not masculine, not feminine, it is neuter, it's a rock. Petros means Peter. And when you name your child Peter, it's like calling him Rocky. But he's not a blockhead. He's not just an inanimate object laying on the ground. He's a person. And so Jesus looked at them, and if he were speaking English, he'd say, you're Rocky. But you just made a statement that is rock solid. What was the statement? Who do people say that I am? And Peter said, what? You are the Christ, son of the living God. You are the one. You were the one who was to come, who is, and who is to come. You are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the only begotten Son of God. We know that, and they know that. The world knows that. You know what? Chances are good whether they believe it or not. Most of the people that you see know that. They know it's been proclaimed for, what, two or three years? Yeah, for two or three thousand years, right? We, we all know that. And so Jesus really was saying, and this I think is quite important, Rocky, that rock that you just laid before us, you are the Christ. I'm going to build my church on that. So it's kind of a misnomer, and I don't want to criticize any church or anything, but it is a kind of a misinterpretation of this particular text to think it was a person like a preacher like, this is Arch Church, or this is Pastor Thus and So's Church, or this is somebody else's church, or this is your church. This church built upon the foundation of that truth which comes down for a couple of thousand years. You are the Christ, the promised one, the resurrected Lord. That's what the church is built upon, a firm foundation. The song says, the chief cornerstone, built upon that truth which comes to us through centuries upon centuries. And we receive it and pass it on. It's the foundation mark. It's not how pretty we are. It's not how big we are. It is not even how effective we are. Aren't you glad? Sure you are. If you aren't, think about it. It's not our church. This is not our church. And when you and I have left this earth, this church stays with its founder and previous owner, 
Jesus Christ. You are the church, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of death, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Nothing, nothing can hold my church back. No power on earth will prevail. It will not be wiped out. It will not be wiped off the face of the earth. ISIS is trying to do that right now. They're trying to rid the, the, the world of this group of people like you. Bully for them. We've been in these battles all of our lives. The gates of hell cannot prevail. People caught up in the very power of Satan cannot prevail against the church. The church as an army storms the gates, enters those places, and ultimately provides the victory. So the end of human history has as that banner, God wins. God's people win. All of history is moving toward that. Well, if we had three hours, we could do a lot more. But I want to look at something else because there's another little bit of a misconception here because it says, I'm going to provide the church with the keys of the kingdom. Now, I've thought about that a lot. You mean the church as an institution has keys that can unlock and lock doors. Now, I, I have, in fact, I have so many keys that I have to wear a tight belt. You know what I'm talking about? Because if I didn't wear a tight belt, we'd all be embarrassed. Those keys get heavy. They get very heavy. When you get your pockets loaded down with keys, you think of all the stuff that you're responsible for. And very frankly, I'm discovering that about one half the keys that I own, I have no idea what they go to. You ever have that experience? So when I think of keys, I think of that kind of power or something. But what are the keys? What are the keys that the Lord has given to the church? Well, let me just mention a couple of them. God is giving keys to us. It was Paul who said it this way. I am not ashamed of, what? The gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. We know that verse. For, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Check it out if you want to. So the first key that we might mention is not something that we have to unlock a safe uh, to, to, to uh, or uh, write a check or whatever that might be. It's the gospel. That the church is given the gospel. We are stewards of the very mysteries of God. We are stewards. We are the managers of these keys. And a major key is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and the church has been given that key to share with the world. How in the world do you get the key in your hand? Well, you get the key in your hand by believing in the gospel. It, it's not something that gets handed on like platinum or gold or, or you can't get one at Walmart. You, you get it at church. By the way, we could pause here and think a whole lot of how we doing and what do we need to do with this key that we have. Well, you know, we, we could say pretty quickly that we've got some work to do as a church of Jesus Christ in managing this keyholder responsibility. We, we probably need to rethink what are we doing in Sunday school, in youth work? What are we doing in outreach ministries? What, what are we trying to accomplish? What, what are the things that we're doing? Maybe, 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 just maybe, we need to rethink what, what are we doing with this powerful, powerful key that could change much of the world? This key that unlocks and locks 
people unlocks and locks hell and heaven. The power of the gospel. How did Paul say it? I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. Perhaps we could even acknowledge that there's another key. And it is in Jesus' promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It doesn't depend on us. See, we're good forsakers. We're good leavers. And he isn't. He's terrible at that. I will never leave you. We have the presence of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Well, another key that we could talk about, think about, would be that we were designed, destined for greatness. That Psalm 8 that we read in that little song thing back there. Created for greatness. You and me. We don't think in those terms, but God has created us to be eternal, eternally with him. Great position, power, and place. A church designed to be a glorious church, the bride of Christ, prepared to present to himself in a great wedding feast. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. In Ephesians, one body, baptized by one spirit, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, male or female, young or old, Baptists or otherwise, I added a few. And this church, this church has a need. What do the Marines say? We need a few good men. The church needs a few good men and women, boys and girls. And I have to say, the young man I talked to earlier here today, I got kind of excited just listening to him. I don't, don't really know him. He's a visitor here today. A passion, a passion for making a difference in a church a passion for a difference and making a difference in some people's lives. Taking those keys, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power and presence of Jesus Christ, designed to be great. Maybe there's some other keys you could think about, but those are the keys. Those are the keys. The activity and the presence of the chief cornerstone of the church, Jesus Christ. We are not our own. We are bought and paid for. Let's pray. Father, we look down the corridor of history and we are amazed at what has been accomplished here in this place. Even this very building is a part of that sign and symbol. But lives, lives have been lived coming and going. Give us reason to believe that you have had passion and purpose for us. And as we look down the corridor in the future, it's a little dimmer. We don't quite see it. We can believe it, and we do believe it, that you have something left for this church, something left having to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ having something to do with the power and the presence of Jesus Christ, having something to do with your call and claim upon our lives. Help us, Lord, not to claim it as our own, but to offer to you whatever greatness there is in us, to offer that to you in humble service. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 282 is a little chorus. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. 
I've been washed in the fountain. I've been cleansed by his blood. I am joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this earth. Part of the family, family of God. We'll sing it twice. Let's stand as we sing. As you leave here today as a part of this well-fed family, go downstairs and see what's on that table down there and help yourself. Because I promised Bill Higgins that we'd get rid of all that food. So you help me out. I don't want to be called a liar. And if you take one of those yardsticks, just remember you can take a little bit of sandpaper and rub Hogan Tire right off there and he'll never know the difference. Let's pray. God, we are thankful to you that we can be named as a part of your family, joint heirs with our living Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we will take that honor very seriously as we move into this world and claim it for you in the name of the gospel, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church. Help us, Lord, to see you and to experience you at work in this, your world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.